Hey, good morning, good morning, good morning, North Place family. So good to be back with you. Always love coming. So much love and respect for Pastor Brian and Haley, and glad that they're getting away uh, this weekend. If you've been around North Place for any amount of time or, or uh, interacted with Pastor Brian very much, you know that this is someone who is so all in on the call of God, so focused on doing the work of the Lord. Uh, oh, some people may use the word to describe Brian um, intense. Okay, maybe. Maybe a few people would be like, yeah, there just seems to be a fire in his belly because he is just, he's just driven. He and Haley both work so hard to where when it comes to work ethic, uh, that's just a non-issue. Something that I think that Brian and Haley have had to be very intentional about is the pullback or the unplug in order to be refreshed. Just guessing I just don't think that comes as naturally for them. And so they have to value it and prioritize it. And so I love the fact that they are modeling for us the importance of catching a breather, investing in their marriage. So glad that they're having this week in a way. I know that you love them. Would you just honor them right now? Put your hands together for Pastor Brian and Haley. Pray for them while they're on their break. Well, a while back... Uh, it was, it was in the middle of the night, and I was asleep, which is pretty much my custom in the middle of the night. I don't know what you do, but for me, I was sound asleep, and one of my daughters came into the room, started tapping me on my shoulder. You ever had something happen to where it worked its way into your dream? You know, it just felt like, why am I dreaming about something touching my arm right now over and over? And so I wake up, and I realize it's my daughter, and she's like, Dad, so sorry to wake you. but there's a snake in Allison's room. I said, what? Sorry, man. Wouldn't normally wake you up, but there's a snake in Allison's room. So I jump up to be hero dad, and I go in there, and listen, this is no joke. Allison is obviously awake. Kelly Grace is the one who woke me up. Bria in the room next to her, they were awake too. So they were just in there. They were all standing around the bed. And so what had happened, was a snake had gotten into the house, made its way into her room. If you're a bit squeamish, if you just kind of struggle with stuff like this, next 10 seconds, check out. Don't listen to me. I don't want you to hear any of this, all right? But for those of you that are dialed in and you want to hear the rest of the story, the snake had made its way into her bed. And when my sweet Allison had gone to climb into bed, this snake was just coming out from underneath her pillow. I hate snakes. You're like, that's a strong word. I can't find a stronger one, okay? I hate snakes. And some of you are animal lovers, and you're like, and you call yourself a man of God. Well, pray for me, okay? Just pray for me to have a breakthrough, because I would love to love them, but until the breakthrough comes, I hate snakes. The only kind of snakes I like are dead ones. And so I just thought, you know what? This house isn't big enough for both of us. I've gotten used to living here. You're a goner. So I killed that snake. But I was just so curious. Like, how did the snake get in the house? How did it get in a room? And why was it under a pillow? And after some investigative work, we determined that earlier in the day, one of our kids had left the front door wide open for like a, a certain amount of time, for a lengthy amount of time. And so our assumption is that's when the snake was like, oh, don't mind if I do, and just came on into the house, made its way to my daughter's bedroom, got in the bed, and under the pillow. Help us, Jesus. I'm right now still struggling, even though I know that the snake is dead. Now you say, why do you tell that story? Because it's a cool story. But in a few minutes, it will actually have a point. Before we get to the point, I'll just say we're in this series. Pastor Brian's been speaking on this thought of being built to last. We're celebrating here at North Place Church 100 years in the church's life and existence. And so this is a model of what it means to be a church that has been built to last. Going through all kinds of seasons, all through, uh, through all kinds of difficulties, and yet staying strong and moving forward. And so the thought is, what does it take to build a life? 
life that is built to last. Build a marriage. Build a family. Uh, parent your children in such a way. Uh, stand for Christ at your workplace or on your campus or at your college or in your neighborhood. Living a life that stands against the difficulties and op- opposition and is able to remain. One that is built to last. If I had a title for today, I would probably call it Built to Last Equals Dressed to Win. Specifically, I want to talk to you about the armor of God today. How many of you have ever heard the expression before, um, spiritual warfare? Just wave at me right now. Come on, even those of you watching online, just wave at the camera if you would right now. Spiritual warfare. How many of you honestly, sincerely, don't give in a Christian church peer pressure right here, all right? But you just really mean that you know that spiritual warfare is the real deal. Come on, wave your hand right now if you just say, I know that spiritual warfare is real. Have you ever thought that your marriage was under attack, spiritual attack? Have you ever felt that before? Anybody ever thought that their their job, your workplace, or your finances were under attack? Come on, you ever felt like your children were under attack? And, and I don't mean just kind of like, oh, I just feel like the devil. No, you just feel like, no, all of hell is coming against my peace right now. Come on, honestly, have you ever felt like that? Spiritual warfare is real. I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 6. That is the most comprehensive passage in one place of Scripture in all of the Bible that speaks to spiritual warfare. And it's the letter that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And as you read about this in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, Paul says, A final word. He says that in, towards the end of this letter here in chapter 6. Because in the first five chapters, he's giving us some beautiful expressions of the Lord's love and promises for us as children of God. I mean, some just heartwarming thoughts. Uh, some very stabilizing and securing and, and, and comforting thoughts on how we are sealed by the Spirit of God and how we have every spiritual blessing from heaven as children of God. I mean, just some stuff that would just give you the warm fuzzies. You're like, oh, this is just lovely. Ah, I just love being a child of God. And then he gets down towards the end of the letter. You're feeling all the goosebumps and all the feels like, oh, thank you, Paul. And he gets down and throws, he goes, hey, final word. Like before I wrap this thing up, you're like, yeah, what, what else you got to say? Look at what he says. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Like, okay, I'll do that. But he keeps on. He gives some context to the reason for the warning. He says in verse 11, put on all of God's armor. Somebody say all of it. Come on, shout all of it. He says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. You're like, the devil? Why do you go to talking about the devil? I thought we were talking about all these blessings and all these good things. Like, hey, before I go, he's like, I want you to know there is a devil. He does not like you. How many of you know that the enemy, the thief, Satan, has come to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. Well, look at what it says so that you can stand against all the strategies of the devil. The devil not only does not like you, he has a satanic strategy, a plan on what he wants to do to your life, to your home. Like he has a demonic design to destroy your marriage. I know for me, as it relates to my wife Casey and me, there are times that we don't see eye to eye. There are times that our personalities would just rub each other wrong. There are times that our humanity will get between us and, and peace, if you will. But sometimes I look at it and I go, this is another level. Have you ever experienced that before? You're just like, man, I'm not even sure what's going on right now. Like this is, it's like sometimes you feel that with your children. Yes, teenagers at times will be rebellious. Sometimes they have attitudes. Sometimes they're difficult. Sometimes you look at it and go, this is the devil. I'm not talking about your son or your daughter. I just mean about the attack. And Paul says, stand firm against all the strategies of the devil for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Everything is more spiritual than you realize. Everything is more spiritual than we realize. We are not physical people who happen to talk about spiritual things from time to time. You are a spiritual being that happens to be clothed in a physical body. We are spiritual people who are living in a natural world. 
And sometimes we lose sight of the greater reality of the spiritual realities. And Paul is saying this, hey, before I go, I might remind you there is a real fight, and the fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against a person and a person, but we're supposed to be fighting against the devil. He says we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. There is a world, whether or not you see it, whether or not you're aware of it, it is there. He says against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Spiritual warfare is real. This is a real fight against a real devil who's launching a real attack. And I would suggest to you that much of the pain, the hurt, the brokenness, the fighting that's going on in our world today, that's going on in our nation today, I would suggest to you is a lot more spiritual than we tend to realize. It's not just personality or political disagreements. It's not just uh, people who have different philosophies or views on life. When you look at the depth of the hatred, when you look at the, the, the level of the, of the fighting and the conflict, when you look at all that is going on with the division and the lies and the killings, if you have any spiritual discernment whatsoever, you will step back and you will see the fingerprints of the devil all over this and I would suggest to you that back to my story at the beginning you know or I have the luxury of just leaving the door open and hoping everything turns out okay if we're not diligent to close the door and to protect our own hearts, our own lives, our own families against the enemy's attacks, you need to know that he is looking for any way to work himself into your job, your neighborhood, your home, your health, your finances, whatever it is. He wants to come in and he wants to attack your children. He wants to wreck your peace. He wants to steal your joy. And Paul is saying if you're going to be built to last, you got to be dressed to win. He says in verse 13, therefore put on every piece, somebody say every piece, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy. In the time of evil, then after the battle, you will be standing firm. You say, well, man, all this talk about the devil and all these demons, like, pass. Like, I just want to sit this one out, and, and I didn't sign up for a fight with the devil. How many of you know he signed you up for it? You didn't even have to volunteer for it. The question is not whether or not you are in a fight. You don't get to choose whether or not you fight. You just simply get to choose whether or not you win. And Paul says, I'm going to tell you how you can win. He says, you're going to have to put on the armor of God. I believe that as Paul writes this, we know that he was writing from a Roman jail cell, very likely chained to a Roman soldier. I believe that as Paul sits in that cell and reflects not only on his own present condition in the moment, but about followers of God and about the real fight. And I believe that Paul looks over and he realizes this dude is not my enemy. My fight is not with this soldier. I'm not here to fight with him. I'm not trying to punch him. I'm not trying to know. My fight is a spiritual fight. And I think he just starts, his mind starts going, there are a lot of children of God, a lot of Christians, and they're fighting each other or fighting. They're thinking it's the church against the world, and they're fighting one another instead of reaching. And, and, and I think he's going like, ah, we're missing it. No wonder people are getting eaten alive. No wonder people are getting chewed up and spit up by that. They're fighting the wrong fight. And I believe that he's inspired by the imagery of the armor of this soldier. And he says, if you're going to stand your ground, and I believe that he uses some just pictures or symbolism, if you will, from the armor of God. Now, as I break down the armor of God, I don't believe that Paul is trying to say, I want the church to dissect what a helmet is, the helmet of salvation. The H in helmet stands for heaven. The E stands for eternal life. I don't think that he's wanting us to focus on the, the imagery, but I will use his imagery for us to draw some principles for spiritual application. The first thing he says is, stand your ground, verse 14, putting on, he says, the belt of truth. That's the first piece of armor. If you're taking notes, number one, you can write it down, the belt of truth. 
I don't know all that he had in his mind when he glances over and he looks at the soldier and he sees this belt. But I do know that in Paul's day, that, that, that for people in general, but certainly for soldiers in particular, that they would often be dressed in a tunic or think in terms of a robe. And yet if you're wearing a robe, you're probably not in the best fighting position, right? So when the boxer steps into the ring, he takes his robe off because he doesn't want to be hindered in any kind of way. Well, you can imagine if you're wearing a bathrobe, you're not going to be able to maneuver very well. But what a soldier would do is he would utilize his belt by taking the tunic and he would pull it up, tucked into the belt. He would cinch it up, if you will, so he would have room enough to, to, to maneuver without getting tied up, tangled up in his robe. I believe that Paul is looking at this and he's saying, hey, you better make sure that you have on a belt so that you can be ready. If you ever stumbled onto a soldier who was cinching up his robe and his belt, you can know that he's not about to invite you over for tea. Okay, this was this picture of readiness of, oh, so you and I might think of it this way. You ever see anybody do that? They start rolling up their sleeves. "Uh Uh-huh, okay, it's on. If they're rolling up their sleeves, they're making a statement I'm about to fight. Maybe you've seen somebody take their hat, turn it around backwards. You're like, bro, why are you turning around? Because it's on right now. Okay, you're about to see why I'm turning my hat around backwards. Are you about to feel right now? Why? So it's like this picture. I believe that Paul is saying at the very beginning, it doesn't matter what weapon that I give you. If you're not ready, the devil is going to eat you alive. Why? Why the belt? Why the belt of truth? I believe he's saying that if you're going to be built to last, dressed to win, you better stand for the truth and be ready to fight the lies of the enemy. John chapter 8 calls the devil the deceiver. He says he's a liar. He's a father of lies. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 says it this way. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. In other words, he comes in acting like everything's all good. He acts like this is not that bad. This is not that big of a deal. He just kind of comes in deceptively, and he tries to get uh, you to drop your guard. You're unaware. You're just, not, you're just going through. And so he waits for that moment to where he strikes. The devil never comes to you and says, hello. I'm Satan, and I have come to destroy you. Just wanted to give you a quick heads up. I'm going to lead off with a right hook. Just wanted to give you an FYI. After that, it will be quickly followed by, like, the devil doesn't do that. He comes masquerading as an angel of light. Have you ever found yourself to where you like, you like subtly, like gradually got into something? Maybe it was an argument with your wife and you thought, how in the world did I get here? You ever had that happen before? Or is this just worked up or you're in fear? Like what was the, the, the process? Of, the devil comes masquerading as an angel of light. I believe Paul's saying if you're going to be ready for his attacks, aware of his schemes, You're going to have to stand, and until you acknowledge there is a devil who's after you, you're not ready. Until you recognize that that the enemy is attacking everything about your life, looking for vulnerability, you are buying the lie. You're taking the bait. You've dropped your guard. You're vulnerable. Paul says, don't do it. Be ready. And second thing, he says, it stands your ground, putting on the belt of truth in the body armor of God's righteousness. Other versions call it the breastplate of righteousness. That's the second piece of armor. You can write it down. Number two, Paul says, you better put on the breastplate of righteousness. I believe that Paul looks at this guard's breastplate and he thinks, boy, we need to guard our hearts. Obviously, the Roman soldier is trying to protect his heart and his vital organs, so he, he wore this, this armor. He wore this protection. And I believe that Paul's inspired and said, man, if we ever needed to guard our hearts, is now. And, and we need to guard it with what? Guard it with righteousness. I think there are a couple of aspects of righteousness. One would be right standing with God. Like, you and I can be righteous, not because of anything that we've done, but how many of you are thankful that despite all the mistakes that you and I have made yesterday, all the times that we lied when we should have told the truth, when we compromised when we should have honored the Lord, all the times that we have failed in the past, how many of you are thankful that the Word of God says when we come to Him, ask Him for His forgiveness, ask Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, the Word of God says that He removes our sin, our dirt, our mistakes, our compromise as far as the east is from the west. And the word of God tells us that the righteousness, the holiness, 
the perfection of Christ is applied to my life. How many of you are thankful that when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for that today, that you have the righteousness of Christ? That's right standing. But I believe Paul's talking about not simply right standing, but I believe he's addressing right living. Meaning it's our responsibility to live in obedience to God's word. God pulls us out of the mud and he washes us as clean. But he says, I've pulled you out. Now you need to walk away. You need to walk according to God's word. And he doesn't want us to avoid sin simply because he's trying to keep us from fun. You've heard people say that. You know, they think that God's just like this cosmic killjoy. Like God's looking out and going, is that fun? Why, yes, it is. Then it's sin. Don't do it. I, well, well, well. It's not like God is saying, I don't want you to get involved in greed. I don't want you to get involved in, in materialism or idolatry of the things of this world or sexual immorality. Because I'm afraid if you do that, you just might have fun. No, that's not the heart of a good, good father. God is looking at it saying, I know where that path leads to is brokenness, is hurt, is heartache. I'm going to save you from that. But I want you to walk a righteous life that says I'm going to what Romans chapter 12 and verse Verse 9 says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. I believe Paul is saying, if you don't want to fall, don't dance where it's wet. Stay away from people, places, and things that pull you away from God and into the unrighteous ways of this world. Take steps that are firm. Guard your heart. He says in verse 14, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. And then look at verse 15. He says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. The third piece of the armor is the shoes of the gospel of peace. It's kind of a long name, isn't it? What does it even mean? Well, originally, shoes were meant to protect the feet. Uh, they, they, they would wear shoes because they walked pretty much everywhere they went. They'd be walking through dirt or over rocks and rough terrain, and so they would wear shoes to protect their feet. And in our culture today, that's, that's partly true as well. We wear our shoes to protect our feet to a degree. But for the most, for a lot of people, your shoes have nothing to do with protecting your feet. It is all about a fashion statement. Can we be real for just a moment? There are some of you that during worship today, you could, you could barely even praise Jesus because your dogs were barking. I mean, <laughs> your feet were hurting so bad, you couldn't wait. Even right now as you're sitting there, there's like a searing pain shooting up your leg into your back because of what you tried to squeeze your foot in today. But you're like, hey but I look good because that's what really made your decision on putting on those shoes. Can I just tell you that the soldier didn't give a rip about what you thought his shoes looked like? But they were meant to protect. They were meant to give him the ability to stand in the midst of a fight. So much so that at times they would even take rocks and, and embed it into the bottom of their shoes or their sandals, if you will, so that they would serve somewhat as like cleats that we would understand. So a soldier was putting on these shoes so that he would be able to not slip around and not fall during battle. And I believe that Paul is saying, if we want to stand strong, we're going to need to have on some good shoes. And he calls them the shoes of peace. Peace that comes from the good news of Jesus Christ. We're all aware of the bad news. The bad news is, all of us are broken people living in a broken world. All of us. I am messed up, and you are messed up. Matter of fact, the person that you're seated next to right now, they got so many issues. If you knew half of them, you would get up and move right now. Just look at them and say, he's talking about you. Yeah, he is talking about you. You know, those people behind you, you don't even want to know. Just look back there at them. You don't even want to know. We all have issues. We all have hangups. We all have hurts. None of us would be smart enough to fix ourselves. None of us are spiritual enough to get victory over our own sin. 
But how many of you are thankful that we're not stuck with the bad news, but there is some good news? Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Are you thankful for the good news of Jesus Christ? Come on, can you just thank him today that he rescued you, he is with you, and he's always in control. Why is that significant? Because Paul is saying, when all of hell is breaking loose around you, when financial storms against you come against you, some of you right now, you're in a financial storm. Some of you right now are in a relational storm. Some of you right now, you feel stuck in an emotional storm. Storms can be swimming all around you. And Paul is saying that even in the midst of storms, storms that will come, storms that will go, the peace of God can stay with you and anchor you no matter what you're going through. He says, if you're going to stand against the devil's attacks, you better make sure that you're standing on the good news, the gospel of peace. It says in verse 16, in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Fourth piece of the armor is the shield of faith. For the soldier, it would protect him from rocks or swords or weapons that would be used against him. But Paul specifically mentions for the people of God, the fiery arrows that the devil shoots at God's children. And he says, we need to take up the shield of faith so that we aren't destroyed by the devil's fiery arrows that he's shooting at our hearts. Because from the beginning, the deceiver wanted to sow seeds of demonic doubt into God's children. You remember way back in the garden. Did God really say not to eat of the fruit? Uh, I think that God doesn't want you to know as much as he does. And so he's a seeds of demonic doubt. Have you ever had the enemy lock his sights in on you and try to sow seeds of demonic doubt into your life? To where he takes that flaming arrow and, and he locks in on you and he says, if God really loves you, then why did he let that happen to you? <laughs> and he goes at your heart. And some of you have had to work through that. Why did that happen? Where was God? He'll take the arrow and he'll, he'll pull it back and he'll say, if God really loves you right now, then why isn't he with you? You've been asking for help. But nothing has changed, and he locks in on your heart. <sighs> and some of you have been impacted by that right now, even as you come to the house of God or you tune in online today or this morning. You've been struggling with, where is God? Why aren't you answering me? For some of you, he has pulled back and he's locked in on your heart, and he says, you're never going to be free you're not good enough. You're not spiritual enough to get out of this. You've, you, you've tried to live for God. You've tried to walk with God. You keep going back to your old sin, your own ways. You're not cut out to be a Christian. You'll never be one of those churchgoers. You may as well give up. And he shoots at your heart. And some of you have been thinking, I'm stuck. I'm forever stuck. This is just who I am. I'll never get victory. He shoots at your heart. You'll always be single. He shoots at your heart. You're never going to have a family. He shoots at your heart. You're never going to make it to college. You're never going to graduate from college. You're never going to get out of debt. You're never going to have peace of mind. He shoots at your heart. Shoom, shoom, shoom. And unless I miss my guess, everybody in here would have a story of what it feels like to be impacted by arrows from the enemy. Of demonic doubt. Paul is saying it will destroy you if you don't stand by holding up the shield of faith. You'll start believing lies like you never had a good dad and so you'll never be a good dad. Your parents' marriage didn't work so your marriage isn't going to work. 
your first marriage didn't work, so this one isn't going to work. He's just going to shoot. So Paul says, hold up the shield of faith. Don't listen to the devil's lies. How many of you are with me today that the devil is a lousy mentor, just a horrible life coach? Can we just agree about that today? Like you just don't need to, don't, it, don't, just don't even, don't let the devil be your counselor. But the Word of God says that the way we stand against his demonic doubt is by standing with the shield of faith. Listen to what Hebrews 11 verse 1 says. It says, now faith is confidence. Somebody say confidence. Come on, say it strong. Say confidence. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. God wants his children to walk by faith, not by sight. He wants us to trust his word, hold on to his promises, so we can hold up the shield of faith to protect us from the fiery arrows of the enemy. I'm just telling you. I pray prayers of faith over my life, over my family. I pray, I pray, like I know the devil wants to attack me. I know that he does attack me. I pray for the hedge of protection around. I prayed over my whole neighborhood. I don't know what you pray for. I just pray for my whole neighborhood. I'm like, Lord, just set a hedge of protection around my entire neighborhood. But I don't stop there. I come in a little closer and I say, Lord, would you just surround our entire lot? Would you just surround it with your guardian angels? Would you just surround it? But I don't stop there. I pull it a little closer. Lord, would you put another little ring just around our house? Would you just do that? I literally go through our house. My wife and I will do this. We will pray over our doors. <laughs> we like it's good if you walk through the doors and close the doors, lock the doors. I, I, yes, great move. But what if you started going through there and praying for doors, praying for windows? You're like, are you serious? You do that? Hey, you let a snake come up in your house one day, you'll start praying over pillows, beds, blankets, sheets, comforters, you know, couches, between couch cushions. I rebuke whatever's under there. Lord, you start praying for stuff. It's a good thing to protect your house by locking a door. But what if you hold up the shield of faith? What if you started going to your kids' bedrooms and praying over, Oh, God, I pray that you would guard their hearts and their minds so that the devil's doubts will not penetrate their understanding. Lord, I pray for my husband. I pray for my wife. Lord, that you would just protect them with the shield of faith so that they will know who they are and whose they are because of what your word says, not what the world says, not what their job says, not what their school says. you got to Hold up the shield of faith. Paul says in verse 17, put on salvation as your helmet. Put on salvation as your helmet. No, no soldier would go into battle without his helmet to guard his head. The fifth piece of the armor, God's the helmet of salvation. Paul's not referring to the act of salvation or a moment of salvation. I believe he's talking about an attitude of salvation. I don't think you saying now that you have truth, now that you have the righteousness, now that you have peace, now that you have faith, you ought to think about getting saved. I don't think he's talking about an act. I think he's talking about an attitude. I think that he's saying, guard your heart, guard, yes, guard your head, guard your mind, guard your attitude with the reality that you were saved, you are saved, and you will be saved. It's an attitude of hope. You can stand strong today because you can see beyond the moment of this minute. How many of you know you're not waiting on eternal life? You have eternal life. You are saved from your sin. You're saved in this moment and you're saved forevermore. For the follower of Jesus, we can walk out and live out that salvation. Some of you need to put Romans chapter 8. You need to write it out and put it on your mirror at home or on your refrigerator. Or both. You just need to write Romans chapter 8. Listen to what it says in verse 31. The enemy wants to come and snatch you away with your thoughts, with your mind, with your peace, with your salvation. But listen to what it says in verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, come on, say it with me. Who can be against us? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said, guard your head, guard your mind, guard your thoughts. Listen, he says, I want you to know you are mine. I got you covered. You can know that you have the best days are ahead of you. You don't have to be afraid of the devil's attack. He didn't say that the devil would never shoot. We know 
know he's going to shoot. He never said no weapon would be formed against you. He just says you can say no weapon formed against me will prosper. Put on the helmet of salvation. Last piece of armor. Verse 17, he says, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And notice that this is the only offensive weapon or piece of the armor. And it's because I think he wants us to know, yes, you got to defend yourself against the enemy. But his goal for the children of God is not to play uh, prevent defense and just hope that we don't lose. I just hope I can hang on till Jesus comes. I hope the devil doesn't get the best of me today. I hope he doesn't rip me up today. I hope the devil doesn't wreck my job. I hope that the devil doesn't destroy me. I hope that, no, he wants you to know that just like Jesus did in Matthew chapter 4, you can respond to the devil's attacks with this word, it is written. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to understand a bunch of Hebrew and Greek and all of these things to stand. But you better get into the Word of God. You better get the Word of God into you because it is the sword of the Spirit. And you can fight against the enemy with the Word of God because the devil is defeated by God's Word. He is crushed by the power and the weight of God's authoritative Word. In 2021, you can stand strong. You don't have to be afraid of darkness. You can win. You can be victorious your family can be blessed your job can be blessed your mind can be blessed your school can be blessed but you gotta stand on the word of God get dressed before you go to school and before you go to work remember the first time I was aware of the reality of spiritual warfare teenager had just recently given my life to Christ I was in my bedroom about to go to sleep And I don't know how to describe this to you except to say that I just felt evil just come into my room. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Others of you, you're going, this just sounds weird. I get it. I don't know how else to describe it. Except for I just felt darkness. Fear came over me. I felt like something was in the room. This was new for me. But the hair on my arms, it was just standing up. I just, I just felt evil. And I was so scared, I couldn't even scream. I couldn't even call out for help. All I could do was say the name Jesus. And I couldn't even say it strong. Like I was like, and I just said in Jesus' name. No, I, it was a whimper. It was like, Jesus. But as soon as I said it, I felt like this electric shock go through my body just said the name Jesus when I did I remember just shaking and and it felt like electricity and I said it again I said Jesus and that time when I said it I felt my confidence growing my boldness was growing stronger and I said it again I said Jesus and when I did I don't know how to explain it to you except to say when I said the name Jesus I felt something tremble I felt something shift and I said the name Jesus and I felt like darkness was leaving my room I said Jesus and I felt like peace was filling my heart and my mind I said Jesus and what I want you to know is you may be facing something that's so heavy so difficult you don't even know how to remember how to say John 3 16 but my question is can you say the name Jesus come on there's power in the name of Jesus you don't have to be afraid you can stand strong you can win but you better call on the only one who can save you I'm going to pray over you today and then we're going to dismiss you yeah life is hard yes we need to stand strong but I want you to know you're not alone there's power in the name of of Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for hope. And I pray that you would help us all to stand strong against the devil's attacks. And Lord, that we would live in victory this year. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Church family, you can stand to your feet if you would. Listen, if you need to commit or recommit your life to Christ, or if you just need somebody to pray with you, we're going to have some just some of our prayer team available at prayer stations as you leave today. Don't hesitate to go to one of them on your way out and just say, hey, would you pray with me? But I just ask in Jesus' name as you walk out today that you'll stand strong, go in the strength of the Lord, wear the armor of God, be dressed to win. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.